Apocalypse Cow. Documentary's vision for the future of food could leave farming in the past. On a Channel 4 documentary, Apocalypse Cow, How Meat Killed the Planet, British environmentalist and vegan George Monbiot presented the UK as stripped of woodland by grass-eating sheep crowded with the agricultural sprawl of industrial farms and with streams polluted by manure. Monbiot insisted that the British countryside is not a picturesque escape but an ongoing ecological disaster. This is on The Conversation by Neil Stevens, Research Fellow, Sociology, Science and Tech at uh, Brunel University of London. The way food is grown in most parts of the world creates these conditions, he says, which harm wildlife and restrain natural habitats. In its place, Monbiot offers possible solutions. Some, we are told, look rather like science fiction, and I'm sure you'll agree. Channel 4 activist George Monbiot argues that if we stop relying on animals to feed us, it could put an end to the global crisis, Apocalypse Now, How Meat Killed the Planet. Visiting a Welsh farm, Mambiat meets livestock farmer turned cultural meat entrepreneur Iltud Dunsford. Instead of rearing animals to be slaughtered for meat, Dunsford is now working on growing meat using animal cells. A Finnish biotech company that Mambiat visits can also create flour and other foodstuffs foodstuffs using bacteria. Well, uh, what can I tell you? I mean, <laughs> uh, all right, let's go on with the article. Monbiot's vision is that vast herds of methane producing cows may no longer be necessary to meet the world's appetite for food, helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from farming. If most of the food we eat could be grown in a lab, he argues, then a fraction of the space currently reserved for farming would not be needed. Uh, uh, the fraction of the uh, space would be needed. With uh, characteristic zeal, Monbiot asserts that huge tracts of Earth's surface, instead of being carefully maintained to grow food, could be returned to nature, a nature habitat like forests, meadows, and marshes. My interest here is cultured meat, he says. I'm a sociologist and have spent 12 years documenting the politics and culture of people working in this industry. People like Dunsford, the CEO of Cellular Agriculture Limited, who I have occasionally worked with. He moved away from his career as a livestock farmer after traveling to South America and seeing deforestation in the Amazon. It was an emotional experience for Dunsford, as he recalls it in the documentary. He said, my personal choices here as a farmer in Wales had a direct correlation with the crops that were being grown in Brazil. Dunsford returned to the UK and became a leading figure in the UK cultural meat sector. Working with the University of Bath, he showed Monbiot a small work in progress bioreactor used for growing animal muscle cells. As Monbiot noted, to some, this is Frankenstein food. Dunsford himself admitted that it looks uh, uh, took a while for him to adjust to it. He says anything that's alien to you can be slightly scary, he said. From the land to the lab, Dunsford's story is unusual. The dual identity of a livestock farmer turned cultured meat entrepreneur captures attention in the politics of lab-grown food. Many cultured meat companies have no link to conventional farming. Most are rooted in a venture capitalist tech culture that grow out of Silicon Valley in many companies, including New Age Meats, Finless Foods, and Mission Barns are located within the San Francisco Bay Area. The same day Apocalypse Cow was screened, Monbiot published a Guardian opinion piece in which he described this as farm-free food that will allow us to hand back vast areas of land and sea to nature. The relationship between traditional farming and the cultured meat industry has been tricky to balance. On one level, as Monbiot suggests, the aim is to replace industrial animal farming. On another, the cultured meat community has been careful not to exclude farmers entirely, with some insisting that cultured meat can broaden the protein portfolio alongside livestock. Some entrepreneurs suggest cultured meat factories could be hosted on farms that grow plant-based input materials, or that farmers could rear animals potentially from rare breeds as cell donors. Notions like Monbiot's farm-free food 
undermine the work of keeping farmers on board. Mambiat also advocates making cultured meat technology free from patents to allow the widest possible distribution of ownership. And this, he argues, could break the hegemony of the massive companies that now control global food commodities. This idea sits uncomfortably with the startup culture surrounding much of the cultured meat industry. Many patents have already been filed. Some in the industry, such as charity and research funding organization New Harvest, align with Monbiot's approach of patent-free open source technology. For others, the idea of giving up intellectual property rights is difficult to, come to contemplate, as selling or licensing technology forms part of potential business plans. The issue of whether to be with or against global food giants is another strategic difference between Monbiot and the main approach of the cultured meat industry. Many in this sector see the technology's route to success through a business-savvy, market-based approach as opposed to fighting against big agricultural or undermining agricultural capitalism, as Monbiot prefers. Closing the show, Monbiot describes how increasing deer numbers prevent trees taking root in the Scottish countryside as he joins the hunt to shoot and then it seems eat the wild deer. He ex the exercise is intended to control deer for the benefit of the local ecology, allowing forests to return and rewild the landscape, free from the voracious appetites of the deer. Across the documentary, Monbiot may have antagonized many viewers, including potential allies, certainly livestock farmers, but also possibly vegans, and perhaps also some in the cultured meat community, who in general will appreciate his positive message, but be less keen on how he positions cultured meat in strong opposition to farming and repudiates a possible route to profit. Now, my question is, okay, this meat is grown in the lab. It's not grown by natural means, grazing on the beautiful grass of uh, the English meadows. What is being given as an input to grow this meat? What materials and substances are being put into these uh, cells in order to have them grown. So they have to be coming from somewhere. How does this protein come about? What is the basis of this protein? Is it soy? Is it, what is it? Because it has to grow by eating something. You, uh, you can't get something from nothing. So he, he has not told us so how this new lab grown meat comes about. This, this is something that we have to know of because we may not prefer the lab-grown meat when we know what's put into it. The same thing with the uh, bacteria-grown flour that they were talking about. Again, what goes into the bacteria to uh, create this lab-grown flour? And I, for one, don't particularly like the idea of eating bacteria or lab-grown meat because humans have never, ever lived on things like this before. They lived on natural, available plants and animals. This is uh, how it was from the beginning of time. Now, tell me what you think. I have no idea what is in store for humanity having to uh, live on things like this. I don't think it's natural. I don't think it's good for our health, let's put it that way. And of course, they will have to indicate on the ingredients in the product label what it includes, what, is, what it's made of. Uh, obviously, they have, they'll have to tell us, inform us, before we consume these things, what goes into manufacturing these lab-grown lab meats and uh, flowers, etc. Anyway, tell me what you think. This is, uh, to me, this is astonishing. I would never contemplate or accept consuming things that were grown in labs, especially not knowing what can be... Uh, the makeup of these things. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media, 
and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.